Well, good evening and welcome to About the Valley. As I mentioned uh, last night and earlier in the week, we had a special guest coming tonight, uh, John Frizzolo. John is a former state representative from the Worcester District. The, uh, I, what district number? 16th Worcester, Harry. 16th yeah. Worcester. Southeast side of Worcester. And uh, if you're all familiar, he had some problems, ended up resigning from the legislature. Well, our other guest, who is Richard Wright from Holden, wrote a book about what happened with John. And that's what we're here to t uh, talk about tonight. And this is the uh, book, The John Brazzolo Saga. I'm going to tell you, uh, I got it on Amazon. And of course, it comes right away. I'll tell you, anyway, two days or something. I read it in one sitting. I just sat down one day. It probably took me five or six hours. Right. But I read the whole book because it's an easy read. And you know what? It holds you. You want to know what's on the next page. And that's, that's a book I, like, I enjoy reading because I want to keep reading. I want to see what, what's going on next. And it's really something about what took place there in the uh, State House. Because, uh, of course, John, you didn't want to resign. Absolutely not. You want to stay, stay at your job. I did everything to, to, you know, to fight and stay in it. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And, and it all started with a complaint from your, your aide. Yeah, my legislative aide. Uh, you know, Richard wrote the book, but if you want, I'll just start by saying uh, I'm home one fr Friday night, uh, a little past 6 o'clock. It was a heavy snowstorm. Yep. Uh, just got done shoveling. I see the... Phone rings and it's uh, six one seven seven two two. That's state a state house. house number. Yeah. I said, who's calling me on a Friday night, six o'clock? We just had a maybe a ten fifteen inch snowstorm. Yeah, who the hell is in the state who's house? Who's at the state Friday. house calling me? <laughs> and I call and it's uh, head legal counsel Jim Kennedy, and he says, John, this is Jim Kennedy. Uh, this isn't an easy phone call to make. I go, why? What's the matter? He says, uh, your legislative aide has come down with. Uh, a couple of complaints. I go, what? What are they? He says, uh, well, we just came out with uh, a new uh, ethics reform, and she's uh, she fears that you're gonna, uh, you know, make her violate it. I said, I I brought the package back from caucus and gave it to her and said, here, read it. We can't do things like we used to. Can't uh, uh, write letters of recommendation. Can't make phone calls. Right. Like we used to. So, you know, you need to read it. And then the second one was, uh, you got an inappropriate picture on the computer. I go, I do? I, I'm never on the computer. <laughs> this is news to me. So from that point on, uh, that's when it started. And in a few days later, uh, she came down. Uh, I get a phone call from my hired an attorney uh, to, to represent me and help me through it. And uh, he calls me a few days later and says, uh, are you ready for this? And I said, what? He says, uh, her name was Jamie Ryan. He says, Jamie Ryan came down with uh, six more, uh, you know, uh, complaints. complaints. I said, what? He says, uh, you help people uh, with uh, speeding tickets. You get people out of jury duty. Uh, you know, you got, you got uh, some of a job and, you, you know, down the line. I go, this girl's insane. She's well, completely yeah, insane. I gotta interrupt you. That was common. Everybody does it. Yeah. That what everybody did at the state house. That that was exactly. The, that was the main purpose of a state rep. <laughs> Come on. They called you. Are you kidding? Uh, well, uh, just quickly because I know I'll, I want Richard to speak. But um, in my particular district that I represented, uh, ninety percent of the calls, maybe more, nine out of ten calls. Can you get me a job? Can you get my son a job? Can you right. get my grandson a job? Exactly. That was I told I told people when they came in to work for me as a legislative aide. You see, it says state rep on the door. It should say employment agency. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's the request we get here. Yeah. And so if you don't, if you don't, you know, that's what you'll be doing. You'll be trying to find people work. If you if you don't want to do that, you don't want the job. And is that that's true of every level of politics in the state? It's always been that way. Right. I, I know people, God, I mean, uh, when you go back to uh, the former uh, uh, Senate president, Billy Bulger, oh, yeah. he was notorious for that. 
He made money doing it. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but well, in, I know in, a, did. in an inner city, you know, type district, that's that's the but number that's, one yeah, request. Yeah. You but know, put people to work. Not in, just in state in, in government, though. In a lot of though. cases, too, all it is is if someone applies, we'll say, to UMass for a job, you make a recommendation. Right. That's all you do. You don't get them hired. No. But, you know, you just put the name in. They say, oh, okay, well, he knows the state rep. Right. And yeah. if you can if you could consider him, I'd greatly appreciate it. Yeah. That's all. And what it does for the for the uh, person employing is tell them, uh, well, the state rep knows them. They know they're a decent person. That's all. Well, in, in some cases, Harry, like we while I was in, we built uh, a new... A recovery center, it's called, uh, in Worcester, the new Worcester State Hospital. Yes. And, you know, it, it was, it needed to hire dozens of people. Right. From the old one to the new, because it was a much bigger, much more, you know, uh, ground, uh, uh, size to, to clean and so on and so forth. And, and, and the people I, I was trying to get work for were laborers. It wasn't like I was asking for, you know, right. eighty thousand, hundred thousand dollar job. It was it was, you know, a, yeah. a entry level position. But my point is those the liaison to that facility would come to us and say, if you know anyone, right. good, recommend please, you know, send them. We we need bodies. We need to fill jobs. I can tell you anyone working in the state house knew someone. You didn't get in there. No, I wish right. you knew someone. Yeah. You know that right. as well as I. Right. That's the way it's been for years. And you talk about the ethics things. I'm on a planning board. I've got to. I got to renew. Go online and do the ethics test again. I did it two years ago. I, said, I don't get paid to be on a planning right. board. Right. This is a volunteer position. I'm giving them two meetings a month and other time. You know, time in between running around the projects and stuff. And they don't get paid. And yet I got to do all that. They, 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 they're pushing this ethic things too far, and it's going to discourage people from serving. Absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah. But we'll get back to your situation, and Richard. Uh, so, Richard, what what brought you to write the book? Well, uh, the uh, uh, y you and I were talking previously about uh, how I came to know John. I I've known John for quite a few years. Um, professionally, uh, <clears throat> I've spent a lot of uh, my career working with uh, politicians running for office for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, or a politician who's finding themselves in a difficult campaign where they have a really strong opponent. And uh, as a political advisor, I'm always looking for information that allows them to manage their campaign well, raise money well and make good decisions about how to spend their time. So over the, all these years, working with lots of uh, different politicians in Massachusetts, I've done a lot of polling. Polling work allowed John, just like it does, it did for uh, lots of other candidates, it allows them to figure out where am I strong, where am I weak, how can I adjust my pr presentation, right. where should I adjust my uh, efforts so that I have an increased chance to win. So. John had uh, two or three good campaigns, and then he had a couple of opponents that were strong. I did some advising, did some polling, and he came out of that very well and got to a point where he didn't need to hire someone like me again because he was running virtually unopposed. He was so popular in the 16th <clears throat> District right. that you don't need to get a poll to tell, tell him that he's the most popular guy. So that's kind of the sequence that I have with all of my clients over the last 40 years. You provide polling and campaign advice, allows them to run well, run strong, and then they're on their own. If they run into a tough campaign again, maybe they'll give me a call. Maybe what they'll do is refer me to another client, which, which my uh, previous polit politician uh, clients have helped me find new clients. So that's how you have a business. So I knew John professionally. Uh, I, I don't operate on the basis of supporting Democrats over Republicans or vice versa. I'm a technician. I'm helping them gather information that allows them to make their own decisions. Well, suddenly one day I read in the newspaper that John Fasolo has resigned. 
under mysterious circumstances. Uh, this didn't make any sense to me. This is, this is a very popular uh, politician, uh, well, well respected, well known. Why would he resign? It was a mystery to me, and when I finally pursued it enough to ask John about it, I discovered that there were things about had, what had happened to him that seemed unfair to me. And I said, John, you've got to, you've got to tell your story. You, you need to write a book, I said to him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, if I knew how to write a book, maybe I would. And uh, that's how I ended up finding myself in a position of saying, well, maybe I could write the book and tell the story, the John Fasola saga. And uh, that's exactly how I ended up coming to write the book. Yeah, I know you talk about this, but I know back at that time, John was so popular, and the polls were showing that he could have won the Senate seat. There you go, exactly. In the district, which of course encompasses a lot more areas. That's right. But you were that popular. That's right. And I remember when he first ran, and actually at that time, it was just a primary race. Right. Sure. Because there was no Republican candidate. Right. If you won the primary, you and, and the you rest. and you did real well in the primary. And that then in there from there was the popularity just kept going up. That's right. So when uh, I said, I'll uh, I'll look at the writing the book myself. Uh, he he said, if you could write it, I'll I, I would support it. I said. Uh, I, I just need one thing from you, John. I need you to be prepared to be interviewed by me. Uh, and this is not going to be a one-hour interview like uh, our, our TV show tonight. Right. This is no, going to be gonna, weeks and weeks, months weeks, and months, yeah. and maybe a year, and it turned into two years. <laughs> because you can't put something in the book that isn't exactly, precisely correct to the day and the person that happened. If something happened in March and something happened in April, you've got to get it exactly right. Mm -hmm. And that required an awful lot of fact-checking. Uh, if you're going to be quoting people, you have to have written or uh, recorded material yep. from which you could draw that is unchallengeable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it took so long to write the book. And you had to get a lot of information out of the State House too, right? Well. That's true. Would uh, the committee allow you to have them? They the, like to keep things sealed up. Yeah, they have secret uh, uh, documents, secret right. letters, and secret emails. I ended up, through my means, getting my hands on all of that. Well, not that they were. I know you have, you, you, not that they were cooperative. I, I, right. I wasn't expecting anybody on the that book committee. book clarifies a lot of things that I didn't. I was surprised to get that information. Well. What, uh, what, what I actually have here is all of the depositions that were presented by the uh, Office of Legal Counsel. If they deposed somebody and they interviewed them, they acknowledged when they were interviewing them, they said, look, this is not a legal deposition. This is not a, a court proceeding. This is not a grand jury investigation. This is just the legal office asking you a lot of questions about what you did, what somebody else did, what your opinion right. was. But they wrote it all down. I have that. And because I have that, nobody can come back and say, well, you've added something that wasn't in it, or you've left something out. You get, you get the transcripts. I've got it. Yeah, that's important. Yes, yeah, that's right. So if you have the Watergate papers, and you give people the Watergate papers, and they read the Watergate papers, you're done. Nobody yep. can argue with you about your content. Right. I have the Watergate papers. When the uh, uh, hearings were taking place and he resigned, uh, uh, Telegram and Gazette reporters, Boston Globe reporters called for the release of these documents. We must see these documents. Why won't you release them? Uh, members of the Democratic and Republican side of the state legislature said, release the documents. Yep. And, uh, they said, under Rule 16a, it's a secret procedure. We cannot release the documents. So they're able to mismanage their investigation of John Fasolo and keep it all a secret. Yeah, and there's no way anybody can find out because they... Because they kept it a secret. Yeah. 
And uh, now, but, but then you all they have to do to... is read this, because then, every word of yeah, the secret documents it, are yeah. in here. We'll get, you know, I don't want to give the book away, but it's really a great book. It's, it, you really see some inside stuff that goes on in that state house. <laughs> but part of the thing that took place was, uh, initially they went after you because your aide opened up a file that she wasn't supposed to open up, number one. She fell upon it. Yeah. Yeah, she fell. But she had no reason to open it up, but she did. And it was something that you didn't want her to see, but she saw. And you don't know how it got in there because you didn't put it in there, but somehow it got in there. But we, that, that's irrelevant. We'll get into that. But that's how it started the mushroom. But then she makes these accusations that you were brutal to her, or, you know, verbally, I mean. You didn't beat on her or anything like that, but you were, that's what I'm getting in the book, that she was saying that you were tough on her and you were making do with things that she felt was unethical, like uh, getting jobs with people. She talked about... You trying to take care of you is the sister that had to go to had uh, jury, jury duty. duty yeah. I, I, what you were saying, exactly what happens. My wife got jury duty for up in Fitchburg for crying out loud. <laughs> I, I had to drive her up there. Well, because my sister lived in Brimfield, right? She uh, received the jury duty for Springfield. Yeah. She's never been in Springfield in her life. Yeah. Well, how so, you, she, yeah, how so she called me and said, John, I work in Worcester. She. Born and raised in Worcester, and she's a cosmetologist. You know, yeah, can I get jury duty in Worcester? Can I go to Worcester? <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with that? That's what a, that's what your legislature. Now, granted, she was my sister, but I got requests like that all the time from right. constituents. Can I go here instead of here because it's easier for me? Yeah. I work there, and that's what we did. And then you know, we, she didn't she didn't skip jury duty. She right. went. She went to Worcester but or somewhere your age, closer. She, you actually you were trying to get her out of it completely. Right. Which, which you didn't do. Which my sister came in to the hearings and showed the documents that yeah. she actually went to jury to. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things that happens in the book is the 13 allegations, because it, it started out, as John mentioned, as really two items, right. which ballooned to seven, yeah. which then ballooned to 14. And even the committee threw one of them out and only accepted that it would look at a well, third. The more they interviewed her, the more they came up with. On Thursday, it was two. On Friday, it was seven. On Monday, it was 14. Every time they brought her in and interviewed her, and the assistant to the uh, head of the office interviewed her, she could keep coming up with more things. Uh, one of the things she came up with is she read the newspaper, and it said that uh, John had, a, had the excessive per diems. So she yeah. introduced that as a complaint that she wanted to make. Yeah, which she had no business doing because she doesn't know what John's schedule is. Yeah. No, no, not at all. So uh, in the book, each one of those allegations is brought forward, and we find out where they came from, who started them, and what was the, what was the thinking from an ethical point of view that, that somebody should challenge this and look at it. And then one by one, every one of these allegations is dealt with through the depositions and dealt with through the secret testimony given under oath yep. in the hearing. And as each one of them falls by the wayside, for example, John just described that John wasn't asked to get her out of duty. It was, can you get me a sighting near where Something I live? I'm familiar with, yeah. Sure. And by the way... There's a government form that you fill out to make that request, and yep. they, they found well, it for her. Why not the Palmer District Court sure. the law, next town over? It's, it's not like something that's uncommon or unknown. Right. You can ask for a delay. You can ask for a movement to something that's more convenient. Um, but the fact that you bring it up as an allegation hangs for weeks and months in the air. Yeah. And under Rule 16A, if you're under investigation by the House of Representatives, the Ethics Committee, you're not allowed to say anything publicly to defend yourself. You, you, you're not even allowed to say, no, I didn't do that, because that's a violation of the very 16A under which you are being investigated. He would be placing himself in further jeopardy by answering a reporter's question. So he had to refuse to answer questions, which you know as well as anybody, makes you look 
kind of suspicious that you're unwilling or well, unable yeah. to answer the question. Well, especially it was two, there was another thing happening at the time that we had that in, he had investigation by a reporter of the per diems. That, uh, now, here's something else that you, you're, you're very familiar with yourself. They actually can go into the Telegram and Gazette file or the Boston Globe file every two years, pull out the two-year-old article, change right. the names, and run it again. Yeah. That article is run every two years for 30 years. Why? Because we've had per diem for all these years. Yeah. And there's always somebody who has the most. Yeah. There's always a top 10. I don't care if it's uh, police duty. There's going to be a police officer who has the most, the one who has the second well, most. I mean, you get that complaint now. You know, all the town books list the salaries. Sure. So there's always made. a top ten. Yeah. You don't, no reporter has to lift a finger. They just write the same article yeah. every two years, just the names sometimes change at the top. But not saying why that is. <laughs> well, why know. would, that sounds like work. You see, but, telling you why sounds like work. Just I, running I the know, same article is easy. the committee, John, Prove the committee that he earned those per diems, that he was there every day. Right. That's, a, that's another good example. And we may not have time tonight to go through the whole book. Right. You can buy it on Amazon.com. Yes. Okay. Take the per diem. John testified to the legal counsel that uh, he shared rides with uh, uh, Representative um, John Benenda, who was also a Western right. representative. Who's They've still, been doing it for years and years there. and years. Well, no, he, he's, oh, he's, he's, passed, he's passed since passed away. away. Oh, I didn't know that. That's right. But at the time, he was uh, 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 a long-term serving um, representative. John and he became acquainted when John came to the house. And they have to drive past each other on the way to work, and they say, well, let's share it was, rides. It was not uncommon for reps to do oh, that. Oh, they do it. That's yeah. been it going made, on for, sense. for decades. Uh, yeah. He, uh, John, before he did it with for Solo, did it with uh, Glotus. Yeah. Uh, it goes way back. Oh, yeah. Common practice, not frowned on by the state. However, when they put up the 42 slides as part of a giant PowerPoint two, three-hour presentation in the hearing. They only put up John's car. <laughs> they didn't put up Benenda's. Now, if you put up John's travel and hide the Benenda travel, that's the other half of his visits yeah, to the looks state like house. He's only, he's only doing half of what he's actually, where, where it's not true. Right. It's not true. It's completely not true. Yeah. Uh, so the ethics committee itself, the 11 men and women who are sitting up there in this large panel are looking at the slides. And uh, in the book, uh, I point out that there was a couple of Republicans, not, yep. not even you know, friendly Democrats, a yep. couple of Republicans said, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. You're, th 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 that can't be representative of what actually took place. So, how can this exhibit and this testimony be considered as valid? It can't be. Well, if you slog through the whole hearing and you look at each case of an allegation, there are situations like this where it breaks down. Somebody reasonable, listening, looked at it and said, that makes no sense. I can't consider it evidence. Why are we discussing this per diem issue? Right. Uh, John acknowledges in the book that uh, there was a, a technical error that he made, which was if you have to attend a state house hearing, which being held in Amherst, yeah. you can't apply for per diem. You can own, even, even though it's it was state business, <laughs> even if it's state business. You see, the per diem only applies if you actually went into Boston. So there are a couple of technical errors, which John... State House. Yeah, right into the State House. State House only, not just yeah, Boston. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Only yeah. when you if went into the State House. you go to Boston City House. Hall, it doesn't count. Right. So <laughs> John and his attorney had uh, expressed to the legal counsel, so if we've made a technical violation, and this was in his summation speech when, he, when, uh, when the hearings were getting toward the end, he said, I hope you would give consideration to my mistake and to others who've been making the same mistake. There go everybody in the state house yep. who goes out to Amherst to attend a public hearing and files for per diem. It's making the same technical error. 
and John was willing to pay that back. Certainly, I'm sorry yep. I didn't understand that, that uh, technical rule. And the Ethics Committee actually understood that. They said, we get that. In other words, now they're all checking their filings to make sure that they weren't applying for per diem in a technical way that's not allowed. But it doesn't represent hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, or tens of thousands of dollars. It just doesn't represent very much at all. Uh, technical violation shouldn't be punished with a draconian resignation. It might have been pay a mea culpa and pay back what well, you owe. You th I got an impression reading the book and reading of all we testimony and everything else that the speaker from day one wanted him to resign. He didn't even want to go through the active commission. Just, just resign, John, and get out of here, right? Well, uh, you bring that up, Harry, and it's absolutely the truth that the chairman of the committee and the uh, Marty Walsh, Marty Walsh, now mayor of Boston, mayor of Boston. Uh, he and along with the uh, lawyer, they, the attorney, they hired a private attorney from Boston. Yep. Uh, I would think, you know, you correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. Richard, but mm -hmm. a pretty high-powered attorney. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, so that they were paying. Yeah. You know, outside of their own attorneys that they have within the state yeah. house, they went out and bought, got, brought in a private attorney. Yep. And uh, they make an appointment off-site <laughs> at a, uh, a, law, a law firm uh, <laughs> near the Joe Moakley Courthouse. Yeah. We go there. And, uh, you know, that's where Marty Wallace, the chairman, said to me, if I ever knew that I'd be holding an investigation or a hearing against a colleague, not only a colleague but a friend, I would have never took this chairmanship. And now he's in the midst of running for mayor at the time as well. So he doesn't want to be there. He's right. going to run for mayor. Right. He wants to be, you know, in every yeah. neighborhood he can in Boston. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Okay, he's running for mayor. And uh, in a controversial he, position to be in, too. Right. Oh, yes. Right. He needs a speaker. Yeah. He needs to have. Yeah. Uh, you know, a speaker of the house that's. Well, he's yeah. He, he going to support him support. if he if he wins. Oh yeah. The mayor of Boston. Oh yeah. Uh, but having said that, after he says that, it then goes to the attorney who says to me, uh, "We have some very uh, damaging uh, evidence. Uh, we advise you to resign." Yeah, so it's in be, your best interest to before resign. Before you even get into having a hearing, hearing. they were asking you to resign. And uh, I, I absolutely come back with, I'm not resigning. No, again, two or three times during that I saw that in the hour book. or so. Yeah, yeah, a number of times we there, they asked you he, to resign. He says, you should resign. Yeah. You sh it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to. Yeah. So they were, they were trying to intimidate me into resigning. And... See, Richard opens up, and I'll let him take it from there. But well, uh, it, it's one of the it's one of the key underlying issues. Who was putting the pressure uh, on on the uh, Le office of legal counsel? Uh, who was putting the pressure on John? And right here, in front of the introduction, before I even write the introduction, I quote Michael Levinson, a, a writer for the Boston Globe. Yes who quotes uh, Seth uh, Gittel, if I'm pronouncing that right, who's the spokesperson for House Speaker Robert A. DeLeo. Quote, no member or officer of the House of Representatives pressured John Fasolo to resign. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you for that uh, hardly, hot, uh, hardly uh, believable comment. Not only did... Uh, Marty Walsh, as chairman of the Ethics Committee and a, and, a, and a member of the House of Representatives, pressure him to resign. Uh, the hired gun, the attorney whose firm collected $292,000 after the hearings were over, he was in John's ear threatening to release damaging information that's going to ruin you. Yeah, and by release, we're talking, giving it to the press. There you go. That's yeah, right. So, so what's you, happening? They destroy his reputation forever. Robert DeLeo is using a spokesperson to go out there and boldly claim no pressure was applied to John Fasolo. The people of the 16th district in Worcester who've been voting him in time and time again yep. cannot understand why he resigns. And they don't understand that he was put under this pressure. And to me, I, I can't think of anything more unfair than the uh, kangaroo court proceeding 
that uh, this, these hearings turned into and the pressure that was put on John to embarrass him and other innocent parties. That's the key. John's a tough guy. He can take some embarrassment. But these women who are uh, uh, well, involved would have had their name and their photographs, which were presented uh, to the committee, made public. Well, here again, it's a situation. You're guilty. Now prove yourself innocent. Exactly. Well, how do you do that? You know, when you're making accusations, they're, they're, they're making accusations based on feelings. Correct. You know, there's, no, there's nothing written. They've got no evidence. None. One, one point I'd like to make, Harry, is what Richard brings out so vividly in the book is I was uh, duly elected by the 40 to 41,000 people that I represented. Yeah, in that every district. Yeah, uh, a, a district is made up, it can go as low as 39,000, it can go as high as 41,000 people. So in that midst, uh, you represent, you know, that, that number of people. And Richard brings out and makes the point, they voted me in, right? but one person, one person can, you know, in, 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 in this book, it shows that he forced you out. The will of the people that put you in, take me out of the equation, yep. put whoever, he or she, who they elect, how can one person take the will of the people away from it? And that's what happened in this oh. case. I don't want to relate to it, but we have a situation right now with, <laughs> at, the, at the federal level <laughs> with the president. They're trying to do <laughs> almost a, a similar thing. Yeah. Kangaroo court. I had, I had an attorney <clears throat> that I hired that could not represent me. Yeah, I know. He could only sit in the hearing with me yeah. and advise me. It, I had yeah. to represent myself. Yeah. I mean, he couldn't make any statements. No. Uh, say they would, this is wrong. Couldn't cross examine. Yeah, no, no. cross examine. Yeah. I mean, it, that is unbelievable. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, every school child knows that uh, you have uh, an episode of, on television of Perry Mason that lawyers are jumping up and objecting to what somebody said, and they have an opportunity to cross examine. Right. Every school child understands that. Yeah. The only people who are not entitled to that. Uh, the people under 16A in the state of Massachusetts are not allowed to have an attorney cross-examine witnesses under oath by rule. Well, I can't imagine anything more unfair than not being able to allow a legal mind to take a look at a question or a presentation or exhibit and apply the law. Well, guess what? In the House of Representatives in Massachusetts, law does not apply. Law is out the window. Obviously. Only, only the politics of the people who run yeah. it are in charge. There's no legal precedent. Well, there's, a, there's an example in a book with one woman who you actually proved that she was, act, she was I want to say lying, but she wasn't exactly accurate. <laughs> that's right. correct. She was mistaken. I'm yeah. mistaken. Absolutely. And that's putting it like, you know, Politely. Politely was right. putting yeah. it po yeah. uh, politely. The, uh, uh, in that, that second and third go around where all of a sudden the complainant uh, brought forth more complaints, one of the ones she used to pad the list of complaints, uh, and, and that's a well-known tactic. Uh, if, I, uh, if I'm negotiating with you, uh, I'll bring in three or four things in a union negotiation. Right. Really, I only want this one. Yep. I'll give up these two or three if I can get this one. So you pad your accusations. Right. You come up with 13. <laughs> Maybe we can get them on two of them. Yeah. Right? Well, one of the padded ones was that she had been forced to lie to the media. That's... That, it may not be illegal, but it may be maybe unethical. I saw that, and that, that was totally, totally out of the, out wrong. But there it's listed. It's listed there as an example of John Fasolo pressuring an aide to do something that she felt uncomfortable with. She was being told to lie to the media. Well, in the book, um, when that particular person, which was not the current aide that started this firefight, but, right. but was a previous aide, 
she came in and gave the same testimony now under oath yes that John had told her to lie to uh, a, a TV reporter right and uh, to use the uh, story that the reason he wasn't going to be able to meet with her is because uh, one of his family members had had an automobile accident and he wasn't going to be able to go yeah well John is sitting there in the hearing agitated jumps up says mr. chairman that's not true Marty Walsh says, John, you're out of order. Sit down. Yeah, you can't even, you can't. You're out of order. Yeah, you, you, He's you, not you, even allowed to cross-examine. Yeah. John doesn't care. He runs up to the front and he starts passing out pieces of paper to every member of the committee. And what is it? It's the accident, accident report. Because the action actually did Because there did was an take, accident. There was an accident that actually did take place. Right. So now, Chairman Marty Walsh. So it wasn't a lie. Of course not. Chairman Marty Walsh and everybody else is looking at it. Walsh looks over and looks at the, the, uh, the person who's giving testimony and says, how are we to understand your testimony given the fact that there was an accident? And what she said was, I thought he made it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, that ended that interview. They moved her out the door. And that's another allegation that went down the drain. It was taking time, but one by one, each of these puffed up, exaggerated allegations was being diminished. Now, by the way, and this is the thing that your, your, your viewers and your listeners need to understand. This is all completely secret. Oh, I know. Yeah. The accusations stay alive. They're on the front page of the newspaper. Everybody's talking about them. But any exculpatory information that would show that those were lies is not allowed to be revealed. He can't, he can't talk to the media because he'd be breaking Rule 16a. Yep. Nobody else can speak for him because they're not allowed to talk. So the lie can stay there, and even though the witness is shown to be wrong and is dismissed by the committee, nobody's going to hear about this. And they never did for six years. Nobody found out about Until it. Until you wrote the book. That's right. Yeah, really, the truth didn't come out until you wrote this book. Not a single word of truth came out until I wrote and, the book. And we have to realize, too, that that aide actually wanted to get out of your office and wanted the recommendation, and you didn't feel it was right. No, uh, well, uh, to be quite honest, I didn't want to give dead weight to yep. someone else. I wouldn't want it done to me. I right. didn't want. At the time, why this all happened, Harry, was uh, she came in to me, her name is Jamie Ryan, came in to me and she said, uh, my husband and I want to start a family. Yep. And uh, I don't get maternity leave as a legislative aide because you're a, an employee at will. You don't accrue maternity leave. But if you are on a staff, uh, you know, House Committee staff, right. you do. So she said, would you mind if, you know, I'd like to apply for I said, no, go right ahead. And she couldn't believe that I was so in agreement, you know, you want to better yourself, you want to get maternity leave, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, you're not going to hold her back. I'm not going to hold her back. So she said, would you put it in a good word for me? I says, yeah, all right. You know, uh, she says, well, it just so happens the chairman of the committee you're serving on, the position is in his, on his committee. Uh, and he wants to meet with his committee members for a coffee. So you'll be meeting with him. I said, okay. So I, long story short, I met with him across the street at the Capitol Coffee Shop. We're talking about what he'd like to do with the committee and how he'd like to run it. All of a sudden, a few other reps that are in there come over. They start talking. Before you know it, he has to leave. It never came up. Yeah. I honestly forgot about it because, well, you as know, we said, we're all talking. And and he's talking. He's and he left. I go back to the office, and she said, how'd it go? I says, good. She says, did you put in a word for me? I says, to be honest, I told exactly what happened. We started talking. Other reps came over. He had to leave. I never had a chance to. I, well, she started to tear up and go in, into her cubicle. And I said to her, hey, just give me his number. I'll call. Yeah. And she goes, no, that's all right. That's all right. I go, no, give me the number. I'll call. She goes, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. 
So I said to myself, okay, good luck to you. Well, the next day is when she went to house council and <laughs> and uh, put in the two complaints, which okay. then elevated the 13th. Now, you know, it, when, you, when you look at the timing of that particular event and the, the fact that she went to the legal council, she had been to the legal council three months earlier. Yes, and John, Without did, telling, John didn't know about uh, it. No, 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 he didn't know about it, but three months earlier, even the legal counsel didn't know what she was talking about because she hadn't brought up what had been her first complaint, which was that there was this picture that showed up when she looked at some old emails. Right. She went and looked, looking up a file uh, yes. uh, on some piece of legislation, bumped into this, and when she saw it, and it's all described in the book, when she saw it, she just put her, you know, she just closed it and said, well, I don't need to be looking at that. She'd seen this. And in her own mind, she's trying to digest what she's supposed to do about having seen this. Right. She testified in, in May, I know he didn't send it to me. Uh, I, I know he wouldn't want anybody to see that. Obviously, it was a private communication between right. him and his girlfriend. So it just so happened I bumped into it. Well, one of the, the committee members is sitting there, and he says, well, if you knew that, why didn't you just go to the rep and say, hey, there's something odd inside your file. You might want to clean exactly. it up, boss. right, right. Help the boss out. Yeah. Complete meltdown. She breaks down. She starts crying. Her attorney calls for, uh, you know, a break. Uh, Marty Walsh, you know, puts everybody on a break. Because the woman is having a breakdown. Of course she's under this huge emotional strain. She's lit a fire. And the legal counsel office and the speaker and Marty Walsh are all running as fast as they can to churn John out the door. She lit the fire, and now she's as much a victim as John Fasolo. And, and Harry, through it all in the deposition, as Richard went through it and, and writes about, she says to the House counsel, I don't want anything to happen to John. <laughs> well, he shouldn't have done it. Right. I, nothing's going to happen to John, right? I don't want him to lose his job. I just don't want to work for him because he doesn't fit with the speaker. He's never going to be a chairman. Yeah. And I want to go places in the building. I was, was it, I was born to work here? I was here? born for the state house. I was born for the state house. Okay. And I don't want just a speaker special. I just don't want to. This is all in her deposition. Well, I know you, you didn't always go with, along with the speaker what no, you wanted. No, that's the reason why. I, I, I voted my district. I yeah, voted, you voted what was good for your district. I didn't represent a liberal district. I, I represented a very conservative. Yeah. That part of Worcester is very conservative. And I voted what they, you know, referred to me as where they were on an issue. I yeah. voted that way. And and in doing so, I voted off quite a bit with leadership, and yep. they, and they didn't like it. And then on top of it, there was a, uh, a, a speaker's race, and I didn't support the right guy. Yeah. And when that happened, you're in the doghouse. I know. Isn't it unbelievable? So, that's another thing that's wrong too. Yeah. But that's that's the way the ball is. That's the way they play ball there. Mm -hmm. But she could have came to you at any time and said, John, I'm not happy working for you. Can you release me, uh, recommend me to another rep or whatever? But she didn't do that. No, she goes through this thing with you. And then she thinks nothing's going to happen? Right. Once and, you open up that door. And when I got the phone call that Friday night and he told me about this, I said to him, Jim Kennedy on the phone, I said, what's going to happen to her? He said, we're putting her on paid administrative leave. I go, absolutely not. I want her out. I want her out. She's an employee at will. When you're a legislative aide, you take the position knowing he or she, that legislator, could come in the next day and say, I'm going to make a change. I'm yep. sorry, but I, I'm going to bring in someone else. And it's happened thousands of times over right. the years that for whatever reason, you want to make a change, you make a change, and they have no grounds to go after and say, I'm doing a good job. I well, don't you, deserve my You need my to do that. The rep needs to have someone he wants to work with. Right. And, and I said to him, no, she's a rat. This girl is a rat. She's a nightmare. I don't know where she's coming from. You shouldn't be paying her. And if she's not happy, let her go. Well, but no, they they wanted to use her to yeah. get more information they to gave, try to hurt They her. gave her, in essence, a paid vacation. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, they, they did. It's they exactly gave, what she did. They, they did. They, they gave her a, 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 a paid leave. Paid leave, and it's it's expressed in there. Uh, uh, the deputy counsel uh, asked her, uh, "When would you like to go on this paid leave?" And she said, "Today." And they said, "Okay," and they did it instantly. I mean, it and didn't was, she work on the side? Well, well, it, it's not uncommon. Uh, aides are paid well. She had a job uh, working, you know, in a, in a tavern, you know, uh, yeah. uh, working the bar, uh, saving up her pay, money, you know, because they wanted to buy a house. And but that makes the sense. purpose of paid leave is that you can't work. You have to. Council advised her. They said, you are currently working weekends at the bar. Don't add other hours that would conflict with the paid leave time. They, they cautioned her on that legal technicality, okay. so she didn't do that. Um, but having a second job, lots of the uh, aides have second jobs. They just can't be during state house hours. Now, uh, obviously, DeWheel, I say DeWheel didn't like it, but he, he got himself in trouble in the end. In, in what way? Yeah. Didn't, he, uh, didn't he have some problems? Oh, uh, no, well, he, no, 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 yeah. The, um, in the context of, of uh, this episode. Not with this, but with s further down the line. Yeah, well, a speaker is always subject to uh, um, lots of challenges and lots of issues, but nothing has happened seriously to him. Um, unlike some other pre pres presidents of the Senate the and Senate some other, Senate, <laughs> other speakers, those guys have had some problems in the past. Uh, the leaders but avoided that so far. One point I like to make, Carrie, is prior to the hearings, we met, my attorney and I met with the 11 members of the Ethics Committee. Oh, right? yeah. And uh, we're going to go over ground rules. And they, they, they hadn't set their ground rules or their rules of how the hearing was going to take place. But they allowed myself and my attorney to speak then. And at that time, uh, Tom, Attorney Tom Kiley of Boston, who I hired, he brought up the uh, example of one previous uh, member of the House back, I believe, in either the late 70s or early 80s, a uh, great guy, Kevin Fitzgerald, uh, oh, had, yeah. had an issue, ethics issue, yep. and he happened to be the attorney who represented him. Oh. And he said at the time, you allowed him to have an attorney to represent and to also cross-examine any of the you know, yeah. facts that might come in that... But at the t he was in good with the speaker. Oh, yeah, he was... Kevin was... You know, yeah, Kevin was Kevin was mo one of the most popular members of the legislature yes. in his tenure there. He was he was great, and in fact, he probably would have been speaker someday if this issue didn't pop up. But having said that, uh, also the attorney I hired brought in uh, what they have is a national uh, legislative. Um, help me, Richard. Yeah, national so legislative association association, and they have a book on rules of what happens if a member should have some ethic violations. And in it, they recommend that you allow them an attorney. Well, you should. I mean, you, you're defending your reputation right. here. And he brings this up, and he says, I'm hoping that you'll just mirror what the Mass yeah. Association, uh, excuse me, the National Association of Legislatures uh, handbook says. and. Walsh says, well, we'll take that into account. We'll take that into but And then they come out and they rule, no. He can be in the hearings with me, but only advise. Can't speak on, uh, on my behalf and cannot cross-examine. Now, if you, if you look at the history of it, their 16A, they have several different ways they can approach it. This is called an, an executive conference. Yep. You and I are using the vernacular hearing. It's not right. a hearing. A hearing has cross-examination testimony. Right, right. It's public. It's open, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. These are not hearings. These are secret operations called an executive conference. They made, this, they made the exception, in the case of Fitzgerald, to let him have an attorney cross-examine and be a little more fair. Yeah. So Massachusetts had established the precedent of allowing it. It wasn't being a slave to their own decrepit right, to, rule, it, it, they had already once done you it. the president, you should continue it. So we'll do it for that popular guy. We won't do it for this guy. Right. Who didn't vote for the current speaker. Hello. Yeah. Hello. I, you know, there's almost 300 pages in here, and every page 
even when I reread my own book, it startles me because I sit there and say, how can anything be that patently unfair? Well, you know, I, I don't want to give away the book, but you do come to the, at the end, you can see where the committee is almost convinced or pretty much convinced that they're not going to, they're not going to have you resign or they, they can't make you resign. That's up to you. But they're not going to encourage you to resign. They're going to probably just discipline you in some way. Right. I don't know. So, uh, whatever they were going to do. Well, Richard will Well, I, I, think, I think one of the points, and, and that was a valid point, because they, they had seen so many of the allegations dissolve. Yeah, right. And even the most you know, virulent one, the one that's the most kind of striking is, as it said in the London Daily Mail, yeah. you know, Massachusetts representative sends dirty pictures. Well, no, the Massachusetts representative didn't send anything close to a dirty picture. That didn't happen. He didn't send it using the state house system that didn't happen right <clears throat> and the reality is the ethics committee stopped thinking and worrying about it they said this is a single episode of a private communication used by the phone it happened to show up she knows she didn't want to see it she knows he didn't send it they stopped talking about it so yep. the thing that was on the front page week after week month after month is gone yep. per diem turns out we've already figured out that that's a misrepresentation. Right. So as these dissolve, John starts feeling like, all right, if we come to resolution, I pay back a couple of per diems that, like yep. everybody, we, we make those mistakes going yep. to Amherst instead of the State House. At late night, it's Friday, we're trying to negotiate a resolution because one of the representatives, Spiliotis, stands up and says, Mr. Chairman, three days of hearings. Can't you step out in the hall with John and his attorney, come with a resolution that we can all vote on, and end this nightmare right. for John Fasolo and his family? Yep. Marty Walsh, he lights up like a Christmas tree. He goes, anybody got an objection to that? No, nobody has an objection to that. Let's come up with something. They all go running out in the hall trying to come up with something. His attorney speaks up. They offer something. They go back and forth. They, they go back into the committee again. They're chatting a little bit more. And then suddenly, John and his attorney notice Marty Walsh and the attorney taking the elevator up. Up to the speaker's well, office. Well, you know, the men's room's on this floor. They don't need to go up there to use right. the men's room. So where are you going at 8 o'clock on a Friday night when the state house is practically dark? There's only one person sitting up there. Yep. And that's somebody who's going to look at whatever compromise you've come up with yep. and give it the green light. Yep. That's what John's thinking. They come down and they say to him, we can't get it done tonight. We'll finish Monday morning. All right. That's a little, that's a little annoying, but I can wait till Monday morning to get my life back. Then Monday morning is when the ceiling collapsed because they came out with this huge draconian list of punishments, including paying back $96,000 to cover the attorney's fees, losing the computer, losing his aid, losing parking rights. And then the whole thing is going to be made public and then sent to the Ethics Commission, including 11 binders filled with private conversations that he had, which were not in the hearings and not taken under oath and had never been presented to the accused prior to this final meeting on Monday. And this would all be released to the press. It'd have to be because that's Rule 16A. I've never seen or heard anything like it. And his attorney, who's been through this kind of thing time and time again, very high profile cases, he said, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. That's how unfair and to me, you know, un American. So what they, they spent the weekend saying, how are we going to really nail this guy? They, they were, they, and give him no alternative. Exactly. And that's what they did. And they did it after their little elevator ride up, yep. the, up to get told what to do by the guy upstairs. The 11 people in that room came to some conclusion and some agreement. They went upstairs to explain it to the speaker and get the okay to say, all right, this is what we have. Yep. And obviously, Marty Walsh and the other 10, total 11, what they said and what they came up with in an agreement meant nothing to him. He came down. And prior to that, on Monday morning, uh, 
we meet, oh, yeah. and and Marty Walsh comes over to my attorney and I, and he says uh, to Tom Kylie, Tom, can John and I uh, step out in the side alone? Uh, you know, outside alone? And he says, uh, yeah, all right. He says, uh, John, don't agree to anything. My attorney says to me, I yeah. said, okay. So we go outside, and Marty Walsh says to me, John, I don't know where this is going, but I'm telling you as a friend, I think you should resign. Now, no pressure, right? No pressure. Yeah, yeah, no pressure. The spokesperson for the speaker said, yeah. at no time did any member or official of yeah. the House of Representatives pressure John Frasola to resign. Walsh says to me, you should resign. I said, I'm not resigning. He says, John, I don't know where this is going. I says, hey, Marty, John Beninda put in for more days than I did, <laughs> okay? And you don't even bring him in. We subpoena John Beninda to come in. They don't even bring it. That's another one. They don't even bring John Beninda in because if they did, he'd have to say, yes, we drove in together, and yes, yep. these, these are correct, because if not, his per diem is suspect. Right. I says, you don't even bring John Beninda in. He says, John Beninda's not in front of me. You are. I said, he says, I don't have a complaint on John Beninda. I says, I'm filing one right now. <laughs> I'm filing a complaint. He oh. goes, you're not going to resign? I said, no. He says, i got to go in and open up the hearing. That's when he turned around and, you know, just uh, unloaded all these yeah, here's draconian. What gonna, here's what we're going to do to you. Yeah, exactly. You know, no no legislative aid for the remainder of the two-year term. No parking spot for the remainder <laughs> of the two-year term. So every time I went to work, I'd have to pay Boston rates to yeah. park. And, and, you know, you're there eight, yeah. ten hours when you're in session sometimes. Uh, no use of the computer. So I couldn't, you know, respond to anybody who sent a, me an how email. How could you represent your district? Right, exactly. They wanted me to be, you know, hopeless to, to, yeah. to represent them. And, uh, you know, as Richard said, pay, pay the cost of the uh, investigation, $96,000. You already pay your own attorney. $75,000 it cost me. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, and then, and then they were going to send it to the Ethics Commission, you know. Yeah. And it just, it, it, you know. What would happen with the Ethics Commission is they would take it and everything would start over again. You'd have to depose everybody. Yep. You'd have to schedule hearings. Go through the whole process and again. By the way, now all of this inflammatory information about now it's all public, right? And people uh, are aware not of the information that discovered. Remember, the ethics committee made no recording of the testimony. All the testimony I have is because I've gone back and got the testimony from the people who gave the testimony. That couldn't have been released. So that means that only the accusations would be made public. Yeah. No defense. <laughs> so you'd have months and months and months of it just continuously oh. being out there while you're trying to represent the 16th Worcester District. It's unbelievable, hey, Henry. We've got to run. I hear wow. you. <laughs> yeah, hour went fast. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, and, Harry. And Merry Christmas to you. And Thanks, we'll see you too. next week on About the Valley. <laughs>